So, Chad, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's great to have you and Chris Ailes in this, in this conference. Um, and the reason why we'd like to interview you is to find out more about what you do, especially more about the part of the uh, life detecting process you come in, which will be what you call the business layer. So in, in Europe, we have obviously the speech recognition software that we use. And the second type of software that is being used is normally an in-house type of software. And it's not normally available to, say, freelance subtitles. So if you can tell us more about what it is that you do, how you come in in the live subtitling process, and uh, the impact that it has on accuracy and quality in general, that would be fantastic. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting us. Uh, everything we've learned here at the conference is very intriguing. And uh, we, we want to support you guys in all your processes going forward. So um, the thing about what we did is we created a product called SpeechCat. And as I said, it's a... It's a layer on top of the speech recognition engine. When we first started this in 1996, we found that the speech recognition engines were designed for doctors and lawyers, people just doing general dictation, uh, but for a very formatted transcript. And over the years, Dragon, which is the, the most popular engine, and the other engines to uh, some extent, Via Voice and Microsoft, they all started gearing towards that professional market where they were trying to produce professional documents, but they weren't trying to produce continuous text. Yeah. And so what we found is that uh, we our software gets into the speech recognition engine and it turns many of those features off, right? And so we're optimizing the speech rec recognition engine so that the court reporters can get better accuracy for, for a faster lay down. Everything we're talking about in subtitling is about the delay time, right? And so we try and shorten the delay to as minimal as possible. To be able to do that, several of the features that Dragon has, you have to just cut them out. And uh, the problem, then we always focused on, we, we did start to focus on uh, the companies that were providing services, but we found that it was going to be more successful if we focused on the individual writers, what we call voice writers. I think we call it re-speakers. The re-speakers, uh, they need to build their accuracy higher and higher and higher, right? As they start building accuracy to a higher level, they need to understand. The software is a, a tool that they use to get to that higher level. So the problem you have is that if a re-speaker is going from one company to the next and switching software packages, they have an incredibly hard time keeping their accuracy level. Uh, we just heard from somebody at this conference saying, you know, I have a, I, I get certain kinds of errors with one company and I go to another company, I get different kinds of errors because of the software. So what we're doing, we focus on the voice writer so that they take with them the Dragon engine and our software so that they have tools to get to the same accuracy every time. And then we provide that output to the captioning companies, to the TV companies, to the courtrooms. But it, the, the output product isn't from Dragon. The output product is from our software into the receiving software. That allows us to help the speech recognition engine. Um, one of the main problems we have is too many changes, and Chris can talk about this further, too many changes in the speech recognition engine can actually be detrimental to the speech recognition process. So we supplement the engine with things that will help you achieve higher levels of accuracy. Uh, all of that technology we put in there is all about getting the voice writer to have a consistent speech recognition day over day over day. That's a hard thing to achieve if you're switching software all the time. So um, that's where our model has focused on. And unlike some of the companies where they focus on the company model, right? Uh, their business is just to sell the service. So this voice writer comes in, they provide everything for them. Uh, those voice writers have to rebuild those models constantly. And we find that it's not as effective. And where, where is it being used? I mean, where as in what countries and also where as in what settings? So we're looking at um, individual voice writers getting a hold of this software using it as a package with Dragon or any other speech recognition they may use. Um, and does that work equally well for captions, for TV captions, or for court reporting, or any other kind of what you call card services? Yeah, so um, the main thing that we, we started out with was court reporting, um, which is just the legal setting in the legal industry. 
And uh, the, the first reason we did that, we also did some of it for the military, for the Justice Department of the military. The reason we did that is because they were spending so many hours reproducing a transcript from a recording. With speech recognition, they were able to cut that time almost 800%. So it was a real big cost savings when we brought in speech recognition to generate transcripts. And then we got to the point where we were starting to do live. And that was in a courtroom setting where, you know, you have the tr traditional American courtroom and the judges on top and the lawyers have a laptops and then we're feeding what's being spoken, the transcript to the, to the lawyer laptops. And they can see the transcript, mark it, and do all the stuff that they need to do to keep court records. That was being done a long time ago. And, then we started getting into the cart and captioning world. And that's where you have TV and the captioning companies, they get an input. You had to, uh, like you do in Europe a lot, the court reporter had to show up to the captioning company and then provide the captioning internally because they received the feed a few seconds early and that was required a lot of equipment. As uh, broadband became more powerful in the US, we started, they started allowing the reporters to be remote. So you, the reporter could be watching a certain channel on the cable TV to get the feed a few seconds early and then feed that remotely to the captioning company to where now almost everything is remote. Um, the, everything was going over telephone lines. Now it's all going over the internet. So you can simply feed the text directly over the internet to the provider and the provider then sells it to whatever service they're doing, CNN and whatever that is. The cart section is is the one that's specifically designed for hard of hearing and um, the deaf and hard of hearing community and there's a mandate in the u.s to provide access to the deaf and hard of hearing so that money helps fund uh, people who are coming from the court reporting industry to provide cart which is really them they're just turning their laptop towards uh, a deaf or hard of hearing person and letting them read the text that's coming on the screen um, and what we, we had to write a completely different set of software for that because the thing that they concerned themselves with is the font size and making sure that these people, if they're not colorblind, making sure they could change the colors and also being able to, you know, add additional things to the text streams to communicate uh, emotion and things like that that are going on uh, with the, the, the presenter. So cart and captioning is more of a personal type environment. Um, and now I think kind of captioning and cart are coming together in what you guys call subtitling for private events, where you've got venues now that are having a court reporter sitting in the back, or a, a voice writer sitting in the back of the room, and they're just subtitling the entire event. Well, then the, the deaf and hard of hearing person doesn't need a person right next to them. They can provide it to everybody at once. Right. And so that's, uh, that's I think, where the whole industry is going now is just to provide um, Card and captioning services for everybody in the event. Exactly, um, and just speaking about that as well, how do you, from the point of view of the U.S., do you see this this moment as a moment of transition as well? Because I mean, you're talking about speech recognition here, but obviously the stenographers as well. We don't, we didn't used to have so many stenographers here. Uh, there's a bit of a transition in Europe uh, on TV. More and more re-speaking is being used. Stenographers are still very big uh, for live events here in, in Europe, but more and more re-speaking has been used even in live events. How is that, transi is that transition going on in, in, in the US as well? It, it is, much to the dismay of stenotype reporters. Uh, stenotype is a, a very mechanical and very a highly accurate system. Once you master it, it takes three years or to unknown years. I mean, I've heard people talk about being trying to master it for 10 years. Um, I've heard people who can master it in a, in a year, but the number of people who can master stenotype quickly is very low. So the driving force is the av availability of people to use their voice to create text and how easy and fast they can achieve mastery of that skill versus stenotype. So if you have a, a, an environment of every job is filled, that's fine, but then you have students coming in is a student gonna go three years and possibly master stenotype, or are they gonna go try three months to a year and possibly master voice? So I think the shift is more about the student's ability to master a skill quickly and find a job versus you know, the traditional stenotype. Uh, and with the errors in stenotype versus the errors in voice, they're two completely different sets of challenges. 
So, you know, we are kind of, as you are, in the forefront of trying to figure out how to standardize and how to improve and set expectations on the voice side so that we can make sure everybody understands the kinds of errors that happen on the Sentinel, Sentinel voice, uh, the, the voice writer side. And what role do you see that quality can play um, in this? Um, you know, because obviously uh, at some point these things are going to have to be compared and, and we're coming from different traditions, but at some point as an assessment of quality is needed. Uh, regulations may be hard or soft. Some people may, some countries may be uh, enforcing assessments, other, others may not be. What do you think about this? Well, in the U.S. we've had uh, the court reporting organization uh, in the U.S. has had certifications for quite a long time. Uh, there is a voice organization in the U.S. that also has certifications, but those certifications are kind of emulating the old stenography assessments. Um, what a lot of them don't take into account is the true nature of, of voice and what it, hit, it is as a quality assessment, right? And that's why we're really excited about everything going on with the ISLA program and the link, uh, Lyric certification because it, it's a voice-driven certification and a voice-driven system for understanding what kind of air, what kind of training, what kind of quality we're all looking for and making sure that everybody understands that. So I think that as the industry grows, and in my opinion, I think that you know, you're probably looking at a 50-50 uh, split right now in the US okay. on captioning and CART. And the only thing holding that back is some old preconceptions by some older people in the industry who are kind of unwilling to see change. Um, you wouldn't believe how many times I hear, um, and I know a lot of my friends in the US aren't gonna like this, but you don't know how many times I hear, well, if I, if I bring on a voice writer, I'll make my stenotype people very upset. And so you don't get a lot of people being willing to use different methodologies because there's, there's a lot of you know, uh, people in their silos not wanting to, to open their minds to, to new possibilities and they don't want to work together. I don't see that a lot in Europe, but I know you're having that fight here. When we find organizations that allow voice writers and stenotypists to work together, they, they flourish. They work beautifully together. So it, it's not a real problem once it actually starts working, that people start working together because, you know, Everybody can throw rocks at each other when you're in separate camps, but when you get together, everybody starts working together. So we don't see a real problem. Uh, they start helping each other, understanding vocabulary, understanding the, the, the genres, and understanding the different um, you know, uh, types of word lists that they need to share and stuff like that. So they start helping each other. And so I think both can coexist together. It's just we need to have um, more acceptance of voice and, and, and a higher standard for the cultural awareness that voice brings to the table and the kinds of errors and quality that voice needs that stenotype necessarily doesn't have to have. And what role do you see technology may play in the future? You talked about the business layer, which is the technology that you bring in um, in this scenario. So at the moment, you think in voice writers plus this um, technology to, to augment accuracy. But how about automatic uh, subtitling? So what, what, what does that fit? You know, I wonder, I thought a lot about that on the way over here. We've seen text being produced by several different means, right? Uh, it was being produced uh, in post-production. You can produce text pretty much anywhere at any price point you want, depending on how fast you want it. But what we're really talking about is in a live environment. In a live environment, you have stenotype, you have voice writing, and, and like you say, automated text. So computer generated text with a computer listening to the microphone. Uh, that's still in development. It's still very, very sh shaky as to how you, know, you can get accuracy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we have to all understand that eventually we're gonna get to the point where computers are like we see in the movies, they'll understand everything you're saying. What you're still always gonna have to have, I personally believe, is you're gonna have to have a person controlling that system, whether it's a voice system and they're actually re-speaking it and they're adding context to the transcript or to the event as they go, or whether they're taking the text from a speech, an automated system and correcting it and adding content. You're always gonna have a person there to make sure that the audience is receiving the kind of content they want. Because 
in our lifetimes, we're not going to see computers being able to understand the nuance, nuances. We may, be able to, we may be able to get a computer to understand what's being spoken in English or some other language, but we're not going to get the computer to understand that, you know, that that person was being uh, aggressive or just, you know, he was crying or whatever. You won't, under, you won't have computers that understand emotional value. And that's, I think, what the people are always going to bring to the table. As we talked earlier, I do believe that what you will see is, you were talking about intralingual and interlingual. So intralingual is, uh, just for definition, is English to English. So somebody speaking in English and somebody's uh, re-speaking it in English and it's text is coming out in English. Intralingual is going to be what we were focusing on with voice writers over the near future. I think the first thing that's going to happen with computer-aided uh, transcription is the intralingual from an interlingual, uh, interla interlingual translation from an intralingual uh, voice writer. So a voice writer will immediately transcribe it into intralingual, and then the computer will translate it interlingual to several different languages. Because computers can really easily understand, they can go through thousands of calculations to try and get a, a sentence into another language uh, Google Translate does that all the time. So automation of that piece is going to come first. And so I think the interlingual yeah. will be more computer-based, whereas the intralingual will be human-based for the foreseeable future. Uh, what about automatic recognition for the intralingual? You don't see that? Uh, like I said, when that, uh, you, have to, you have to look at the actual physical environment. To get intra lingual to get speech recognition to work well for you you need a well placed microphone you need a you almost, you almost need a pristine environment everywhere you go when you look at people up on a stage and they're they're talking with a wireless microphone right i don't care how expensive your wireless microphone is when the guy walks away from the transmitter the signal frequency changes that affects that small difference affects speech recognition so you might have some environments that, that do machine translation fairly accurately. But as a general thing, right, because you want to try and create a standard where it's the same delivery all over the platform, that's going to, I think, have to have a person involved to make sure that the system is localized to a controlled environment, yeah. like a translator in the back room that doesn't have a lot of noise around them. Because if you're in an auditorium, there's no hope of you getting a great translation from that. But if you want machine translation to work well there, you may actually need the human to provide an intralingual translation or transcription that is actually nice and tidy so that the, the, the sentences can be actually likely to be well translated. Because if it's messy, if it's full of hesitations, if it, is it not going to be more difficult for the machine translation to get it right? It is. That's something we were talking about earlier. Uh, you know, I think one of the big things that we talked about at this conference that, that really was beautiful to see is um, we talk about what the, the effective rate of a consumable quality translation is. We sometimes translate at 180, 200 words a minute. That is not an effective consumable rate because the average person reads at 120 words per minute. So we, this entire conference here was very enlightening that you know, we all have to understand that if you want consumable translation, we're gonna need to reduce and we're gonna to need to paraphrase. In the reduction, the paraphrase, a machine will never do that correctly. Well, never, not in our lifetime. <laughs> that was the other question. You don't think, so machines are going verbatim so far, obviously. Machines, when you're talking about machine recognition, it is gonna be verbatim, For, period. So you think that a machine-made reduction or paraphrasing, that's a tricky thing, right? That's very tricky. Uh, t t you, you, you're never gonna be able to trust a machine to paraphrase uh, what you're trying to say. Because there's so many different slang words and, and what people are talking about that a machine will, you know, God forbid it translates something incorrectly at a, at a, a big event, you know, and you, you lose your audience very quickly with mistranslations, right? So if you, if you say something and, a and the translator gets it wrong, the audience quickly starts laughing at the translation and loses where the speaker's at. So it's incredibly important for the, the thought to be conveyed properly. And so a reduction is going to need to have a high quality person to be able to do that reduction meaningfully. Now, once it's reduced, a machine can go interlingual very easily because that can be thousands of calculations to make sure that we're translating that same exact concept correctly. But the original reduction is going to need to be done by a human, at least in the foreseeable future. 
Fantastic chat. Thank you so much. This has been really, really enlightening for us. So we're looking forward to working with you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, and, and great conference. And, and we hope you guys have many more of these in the future. Will do. Thank Thanks. you, Ted.